Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. All right, everyone. Today I have with me on the show Ross Rosenberg. He is the owner of the Clinical Care Consultants in Chicago and also the Self-Love Recovery Institute. He's a psychotherapist, a trainer, and an author who specializes in codependency, narcissism, trauma, and sex addiction. He's also a professional trainer, keynote speaker, and the book in particular that we're going to touch on today is The Human Magnet Syndrome, The Codependent Narcissist Trap. And it's a book that provides answers to why patient giving and selfless individuals somehow seem to be attracted to the self-centered, the selfish, and the controlling partners. And as listeners of the show know, we've touched on this topic many times, and so I know this is really going to resonate with many of you. So today, we're going to learn a little bit about why some of us are attracted to the people who will end up hurting us. So thank you so much, and welcome to the show today, Ross. Thank you so much, Ami, for having me on your show. I'm really excited about this. Awesome. And I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. Um, I have many listeners that are actually men who have been in narcissistic relationships. And so when we talk about the narcissistic um, codependent uh, condition, sometimes we, we tend to lean in thinking that it's mostly women at the, you know, the hands of men. But I've been surprised, honestly, by how many men actually write to me privately. And so I know they're listening or they're going to be ready for, for this episode. Right. Um, you know, I've talked about relationships on the show and we've talked about how our biology wires us to connect with people and that we are dependent on each other to an extent. And sometimes it's normal. It's healthy. Our nervous systems respond positively to interactions with our intimate partners and family members. We get a sense of safety and love and comfort when we're in the presence of people that are doing good for us. But for some people, and this is present company included, we, some of us find ourselves in relationships that actually lacks that balance and we end up becoming more or less a blood donor to a vampire and all of our emotional resources are being drained from us and we're never really getting anything in return. So I, I haven't had anybody on the show yet actually define codependency and so I'm hoping you can actually kick us off today by talking about what it means to be codependent versus healthy dependent on another person. Okay. But before I do that, um, um, I, I want to just give a little bit of a backstory of my book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, which, by the way, um, um, the first one was written in 2013, and the second was in 2018. And, and unfortunately, uh, many people are buying the old one. So quickly, if you're going to get the book, get the one that looks like this. Okay. Um, I, when I wrote The Human Magnet Syndrome, um, I had this idea that I severely disliked the term codependency. The term codependency um, was pejorative, it was degrading, it was negative. And it, it really talked about what was wrong with a person and did not give much more information about um, 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 the problem other than telling that person, you have to stop these bad habits. And if you stop these bad habits, everything will be fine. And unfortunately, the, the term codependency grew over time. And it became this monster concept that defied a definition. And if you would have interviewed me 20 years ago, I could answer what codependency is in about 15 minutes. But in the human magnet syndrome, I simplified it. And I simplified it for a reason to help people understand something that they can change. So a codependent is a person who is in a relationship with someone else who gives all or most of the love, respect, and caring with hopes that it's mutual and recipro reciprocal. And when it's not, they try to make it mutual. And when they can't, they stay in the relationship. That's the simple definition that works because it acknowledges that codependency is is not a personality type. And this is so important for your viewers and listeners to understand that there are so many different personality types um, that do not make someone a codependent. You can be a liar, a cheater, and be codependent. 
You can be honest and angelic and be codependent. You can be an alcoholic and be a codependent. You can be a manipulator. So to simplify it, someone, it's, it's, a, it's a problem with the distribution of love, respect, and caring in a relationship. When you give everything, expect it to be returned, and you stay, that explains codependence of all sorts, all personality types, and all backgrounds. I see. Now, is this different than, um, because you also talk about self-love deficit and a self-love deficit disorder, Hmm. which, um, you know, codependency um, by the definition that you gave there is, that doesn't necessarily to me imply that I don't care about myself. Um, I just care about giving you more and waiting for it. But yet you also have that term. So I'm curious on how you connect the two of those together. You've now made the question more complicated, which I love. (laughs) Um, and and a little back, more backstory. I've come to understand this codependency thing because of my own involvement with narcissists, you know, and being married and divorced. And with all the shame that that caused, um, I had to figure out, you know, what the heck, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I falling in love with these great people that seem so wonderful in the beginning who feel like a soulmate? And as my dad would say, end up as a soulmate. Mm-hmm. And and it was through all this therapy, all of, you know, my personal trials and tribulations, I came up with what would become um, the human magnet syndrome and the explanation of codependency. After the publication of the human magnet syndrome, I started to rework the ideas of codependency. I already said, I don't like the word codependency. So in human magnet syndrome, I changed the definition to make sense that, and, and without it being shaming. And over time, I knew I, 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 I knew I had to change the name. And I came up with this, this, this idea that became the replacement term. Codependency is now called self-love deficit disorder. And the reason I changed the name is because the disorder needs to reflect the problem. If you have attention deficit disorder, that means you have attention deficit. If you have depression, what does codependency actually mean? It, it doesn't mean that much. It means, and I, I'll, save, I'll save your viewers and I'll stop myself and not going into history. But everyone who is a codependent has a deficiency in self-love. They, they, are, they are filled with shame. They are beset with loneliness. And they come from a trauma. They had a childhood that's filled with trauma because of another narcissist. So the name aptly and correctly explains the person. So the new, the, the new name for codependency is self-love deficit disorder, as I say, SLDD, and the person is self-love deficient. So the codependent is an SLD. And these names were immediately embraced by the codependency um, um, recovery, the mental health, the addiction community, because it felt right. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't shaming. So that's why I've not only created a new name, but all of my work now that follows the human magnet syndrome, which I call the codependency cure, focuses on the problem, the self-love death disorder, and the solution. Whereas my book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, talks about the problem and explains it. So can you sometimes be codependent? I mean, talking about now this definition that you have, that the root of all of this is that there's a a lack of genuine self-love. I mean, we talk about self-esteem, we talk about confidence, and it's easy to project those that you seem to have, or maybe even believe in yourself that you, hey, I'm actually a confident person. I must have self-love. But that may not actually be the case because somewhere deeper inside, there's genuinely you know, a self-love. So let me start here before I jump into my, the question I originally asked you. What is self-love? Okay, and I got a note here so I can go back to a question, something you just said. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but real quickly, the, the difference between confidence and self-love, um, the best way to answer that, and then I'll answer what is self-love, is, is uh, I'll say this is to make my point, is that a narcissist, a sociopath can be confident. There are so many personality traits that are independent of SLDD, self-love deficit disorder. Um, And so confidence, you can be confident and not love yourself. It's what you're confident about. So self-love 
is a feeling of acceptance, um, um, support, affirmation, um, emotional connection to yourself. So, so if you, it's easy to explain what is love. You know, I love someone when I do this, this, and this. Well, you take that same definition of what is love to another person and you just turn it around. Self-love is to treat yourself as beautifully, wonderfully, supportively, empathetically um, as you would another person. And someone with this disorder, this codependency or self-love deficit disorder, they never learned about self-love because at the earliest moments of their life, when their personality was developing, they learned what was wrong with them and why that only through sacrificing, being invisible and taking care of others, that they can be loved. And that is and was the beginning of self-love deficit disorder. Right. Now, can sometimes that trauma also just be from just sheer neglect? that just not being even witnessed. I mean, maybe some people didn't find themselves. I know I did. I found myself in a role of being an oldest sister, taking care of younger right. brothers, having an emotionally immature mom and, you know, kind of navigating the, the minefield that that was. But I, I wonder, you know, out loud, if there are people that never really had those experiences, but still have this lack of, um, of feeling that they have value and are important because somebody just was emotionally neglectful, just didn't look at them and didn't care to instill in them a sense of value for them. And they didn't have any particularly, you know, strong responsibilities or anything like that. Does that question make sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. Um, so to, to understand the impact of neglect on the origins of SLDD, um, I, I ask your viewers to, to go to my YouTube channel and there's an animation I have the six minute animation that explains this in detail, but I will, it'll suffice to say SLDD makes sense if you understand it as a pyramid. The cause of SLDD is attachment trauma. And attachment trauma is being raised um, by a narcissist, pathological narcissist, and a codependent parent. And during the attachment phase, which um, is from birth all the way up to um, age eight, and, and, and I extend it to adolescence, um, the parents' connection and, and um, love, nurturing, and, and providing safety builds self-esteem, self-love, builds a confidence, builds all the, these beautiful, positive human attributes. So um, attachment, trauma, is when you are raised by a narcissist and if you're a child who's going to be an SLD, a codependent, you learn that the only way that you can be lovable is by molding yourself into the type of person the narcissist needs. And that is traumatic. Every SLD has a different form of attachment trauma. Some will describe neglect. Some will uh, deprivation. Some will describe abuse. So there's different forms of trauma during um, a child's um, a, ch a child's life that can cause SLDD or codependency, and neglect is one of them. But there, it is it is the disruption of a very important part of human growth and development is to believe that someone loves you and will take care of you and you can just be yourself. So yes, neglect, um, abandonment, those are very strong indicators of someone who's um, more likely than not going to be an adult self-love deficient person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's one of those, you know, it's a realization for myself, you know, much later in life, because I, like I said, from an external point of view, you know, people looking at me would, um, would normally see a person. Again, we go back to the word confidence, right? Somebody right. who is confident, who has, um, you know, and I've always felt I've had high levels of self-esteem. Like I do value myself, but I also learned through my own experience in recovery how, how little I actually did in certain areas, especially when it came into personal relationships. And so that's why I, you know, I don't want to belabor this topic, but I think this is part of sometimes people opening their mind up to the real healing process is to, is to understand these nuanced differences between, um, you know, 
walking into a room, being able to talk, be, feeling comfortable around people, but yet at the same time, at the end of the day, you know, always putting yourself second when it comes to that one intimate relationship. And I guess this is where the question was, is are we sometimes codependent and sometimes we're not? Because I think it, it, to me, it feels like in certain relationships with certain people, I don't have that inclination to give up my needs to them. So, I mean, I mean you, you are doing what so many other people um, struggle with is you are still embracing the old definition of codependency. So, um, um, and then I'm going to actually go back. I'm not going to forget this. I'm going to go back to the confidence question. Okay. But, the, but if you accept the, the definition of codependency as a, as a problem with the distribution of love, respect, and caring in relationships, and you still stay in that relationship, then you also acknowledge there, is, there are different personality types that do this. So you can have someone who is a, a brain surgeon who goes home to a narcissistic husband um, 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 and, and, and they're an SLD. He goes into work and he's confident. He's brilliant. He wrote a book. book. Actually, I think I, I messed up the genders, but it doesn't really matter anyway. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, um, so SLDD or codependency is measured by um, the distribution of, of love, respect, and caring in a relationship, and it acknowledges that there's all sorts of personalities Another, and, and this is paradoxical, SLDs can be extremely confident and competent. They are caregivers. They are caretakers. They're empathetic. So if they have a job and where they're a nurse, they're a psychotherapist, they're a clergy member, that part of their personality that, um, that ultimately became the self-love deficit disorder, that enables them to do jobs really well. Now, they might not know how to take care of themselves. So competence is not connected to SLDD unless we're talking about competence and healthy relationships. Confidence is not connected to SLDD unless it's about confidence about you as a person. Because if you have self-love deficit disorder, you might be confident in how well you take care of others, but you're not going to be confident about who you are and how lovable you are. Yeah, I think I... And and for me, I can see people having feelings of self-doubt about themselves. I know in my brain, and I'm only sharing this because um, I, I think it's relevant. Sometimes people are like, well, I, I've never really, I've never really down talked myself. And, but yet it was just a complete fog about an, a lack of awareness that some of my actions and my behaviors were the symptoms of the self-love deficit. You know, and it was realizing that, no, I never, I never sat there and looked, you know, looked in the mirror or, or had secret conversations with myself about how I'm worthless and I'm not that, you know, I'm valuable. In fact, my, my self-talk was always the opposite of that, right? That was the voice in my head of like, I know that I've got something to share. I know that I'm important. I know, you know, and all those, you know, that what we would think are good conversations to have with yourself, but it was the, you know, the switch in my head went off when I realized that, but my behaviors were right. really how I felt about myself, you know, and, and I think sometimes for, you know, people that are listening and watching that is, um, you know, get out of the idea that it's the mental talk, but start to observe your actions because right. your actions will be really a good signal. And that was what changed for me was to see, okay, but what I do is totally different. And what I do is those symptoms of, you know, that I am having some degrees of uh, difficulty understanding my true worth with, yes. it, you know, so what's interesting is listening to you, it reminds me of the importance of the gaslighting concept in, um, in understanding self-love deficit disorder and the human magnet syndrome. And that's why in my new book, I actually created a whole chapter. Our thoughts, we, of course, identify our thoughts as who we are. Um, and what I introduce um, to, to, to my, my community, I call my self-love recovery community. We can talk about that later. Or, or SLDs or codependents are working on themselves is the fact that our thoughts might not be ours. And so, or our thoughts can be distorted. For example, you, as I said before, SLDs come in all sizes and shapes. You can have competent, confident people. And I'm not saying you're an SLD or not, because I don't know you well enough to diagnose you. And plus, that would be bad form. <laughs> diagnose the podcast. For, right. So. In our 20-minute conversation so far. <laughs> right. But uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just assume you're sweet, intelligent, and very, and very nice. <laughs> but um, but um, you can be an SLD and have confidence and, and, and pseudo self-esteem and have all these nice things that you have um, in your mind and you tell yourself and then go home 
and, and then go home to a narcissist um, that treats you badly and makes you feel badly. And, and, and that's why it's so important for um, your viewers and listeners to understand that personality type, thinking type is independent of being an SLD because um, there's so many people that are so successful in so many areas, but go home and then they struggle with the core shame that is a secret. And it's a secret from everyone else. But, and, and, and they live these dual lives. And the other thing I want to say is our thoughts. We can think, and I know this because this is what happened to me. I got lost in my own thoughts. I escaped in writing and creating things and being a therapist. And that made me feel good about myself. And it was, but I would go home. And if I wasn't in a relationship, I was beset by loneliness or what I call core shame, or I was in a relationship with someone who treated me badly. So we have to be really cautious by confusing um, our thoughts and what we do on the outside of relationships um, as definitions of either being or not being codependent or, or an SLD. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, uh, I, I like bringing that point up for two reasons. One is for the person who's in these relationships who, you know, should be coming and hopefully coming to this understanding that they may be an abusive relationship, but also on the outside of this, and I've talked about um, abusive relationships on the show before, it is the paradox that people see when they see a person like myself and not understand the abuse I was dealing with at home. Because the two things don't seem to relate even in society and culture, that somebody who is strong-willed and independent and intelligent can actually go home and be victimized pretty frequently and regularly oh. and, and actually not know how to get out of that and how to be trapped in all of that. That doesn't, that doesn't really kind of correspond to most people who have not been through those types of relationships. And so I always point that out too, because I always caution people when somebody tells you they're in an abusive situation, you really do, should believe them because just because you think that they should be, you know, no better, that was a, a, a word, should be smart enough to get out of it. They look like they're strong enough to get out of it in these relationships, it's not as easy as that. Like you just said, like you can actually be primed for this toxic connection and have all the things that appear on the surface, like you wouldn't be. So, so you know, let, let me tell you a quick uh, story. I used to give trainings um, all over the world, um, in the United States, and they're mostly were, were therapists. And about 90% of all therapists start off as SLDs. It's just a fact. And, and I won't go into it. It's in my book. And so I would give these trainings um, to therapists who, a good therapist, by the way, starts off as an SLD, does their own work, and they get better. Mm -hmm. But the point is they are so competent at listening. And, and it could be a nurse, too, or any other profession that, that attracts SLDs. You can be so competent in what you do because you're SLDD. Your self-love death disorder and taking care of others while ignoring yourself can make you a master at what you do, depending on your intellect, your motivation, but it doesn't define how healthy you are in the insight and in your own personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Totally. Now, um, I want to talk about um, the, the magnetism, right? So this, um, because that's what kind of the concept here is, what is this attraction between the um, SLDD with the, the narcissist? I mean, that's the root of all of this. Because I do know, like I said, men and women alike constantly, and, you know, attraction is one of the things that even for myself, I find... Um, yeah. it's a, it's a little, it's, it's my tuner that I'm, I'm most, to be honest, and I'll use this word. It's the one I'm most scared of because after having been kind of like zeroed in on some of these unhealthy and toxic relationships, I, I have a sense of fear. Now, next time my, my tuner goes off of like, okay, well, hold on, you know, this has driven you into these really bad situations. And so when it comes to attraction, let's talk about that. And, and what does that look like here? I mean, why are, why are codependents like, you know, kind of focusing in on, you know, a narcissistic type of a person. So in other words, what is the human magnet syndrome? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, and I will give you a nice short answer. Um, short ish. Um, this whole idea came to me um, and by, you know, of course I'm spiritual. So I, I, I believe, you know, my, my deceased mom, who I call my codependent angel, um, helped me out. But it can't, this idea came to me that um, before I ever wrote anything, had any idea that would become the human magnet syndrome, is that 
codependents are attracted to narcissists because of they're like dancers. The leader of a dance loves to dance. The follower of the dance loves to dance, but they can only have fun when they match up. The person's got to let the followers got to let go and let the the leader take control. And that matching makes everything fluid. Now you, and if you take that and understand that an SLD, remember we're going back to the distribution of love, respect, and care in the, in the definition of codependency, they give everything. They're, they're, they're often compassionate, empathetic, and, and patient and invisible. Um, so the, we'll call them the, the follower in the dance. The narcissist takes it all. They're self-centered. They're, um, they can be controlling. They're entitled. Um, these two opposites, giver and taker, they don't work when they are paired up with someone like themselves. So if we use a dance uh, metaphor, they're going to step on each other's toes. They're going to be pulling each other. So when a person who is an SLD meets a narcissist, their personality type matches up. They and they can lift, they can go on a date, say it's on match.com or you know, Tinder or whatever, and they can listen all night to someone who's so charming and funny and sexy and edgy or you know, or sensual, and they will be so attracted to them because that person feels so right for them, and they don't even think twice that that person hasn't asked them much about themselves because as the opposite dancer, they don't have self esteem and they're afraid to talk. And the narcissist will, will be so attracted to the SLD or the codependent because they have someone that will be compassionate and listen to the fact that they've been married and divorced five times, someone who can hold their hand and cry when they say they're not paying child support and they've lost their jobs. And, and, and there's just like what the people, so when these opposite personality types meet each other, they don't say, wow, you're screwed up and I'm screwed up. That's a match. No, they say, oh my God, you make me feel so comfortable because their psychopathology or their mental health problems match up. So in the process of arguing with my publisher on the title for my book, which I didn't like their title, um, I came up with the idea of the human magnet syndrome because magnets, the, 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 the North Pole or, and the South Pole, as we know, opposites attract. Um, and so that, that was another metaphor that helped me explain why this happens. And I'm not going to go into this unless you want to ask me a question later, but um, I actually wrote a chapter in my book explaining chemistry. We all know it's, there has to be chemistry. Chemistry is the unconscious experience of this matching up, that you're always going to have chemistry with someone who is opposite and matches up with you. So I'll leave it at that because I know I can, I can go on and on. Too. Well, that's actually what I wanted to talk about because um, when we're talking about this, this element of attraction and um, because I have seen and heard, I know that through my own therapeutic process, I'm, I'm, I'm making this better for myself, but I was originally like, you find chemistry with people that ultimately end up being bad for you. And you keep repeating that over and over again, because we, we also believe in society in this love at first sight notion. Right. And so then when we see somebody that just strikes, you know, strikes us right away, then of course we feel like we have to follow them because that means there's something in there like that. That means that there's some soulmate match you know, right. and that whole process there. But when you've been through enough of these relationships and you begin to grow and develop, you're realizing, okay, chemistry might actually, you know, doesn't always mean it's good chemistry. It's chemistry. Oh. <laughs> There's something going on, but that doesn't mean that it equals an, an amazing, like, you know, love match for the rest of your life. So I, it is my next topic. Like, please go on into that because that's why people mm -hmm. listen in their forties, you know, at, that are single right now and understanding like, oh, gosh, I'm really tired of these really, you know, bad relationships relationships here, but why do I keep ending up with somebody, you know, that I know is going to hurt me or they don't even know that they just, they just get really frustrated with the people they end up with. And it's those people's problems. You know, it's like, well, I just, you know, again, I just attract, you know, the wrong people, not so, maybe aware that they're also attracted to that person. You know, it's not just them coming to them. They're also going towards them. They're guided in towards them. So I'm going to tell you the explanation of chemistry, and which is why Match.com or eHarmony would never hire me. <laughs> <laughs> right, and why I don't use those things right now. Because, but go continue. <laughs> yeah, that's another subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but uh, so um, chemistry, um, I'll start simple and I'll just go a little bit more complicated. Chemistry is the matching of opposite personality types and it's an unconscious process. So if you think about your personality type is developed at a very young age um, um, because of how well your parents took care of you, your attachment. So if you had normal parents, I mean parents that made mistakes that weren't perfect but loved you unconditionally, you would not have attachment trauma and you would just have your garden variety problems as you grow up. Um, but if you had a narcissist codependent parent, you would have had attachment trauma. And we talked about this earlier, so I won't go into it. But from attachment trauma, um, you develop what I call a relationship template, which is this belief system of your value and worth and, and roles that you, are, you feel you're good at and, and relationships. So if you survived your childhood by being the gift child or the trophy child, and you were able to make your narcissistic parent happy by molding yourself into what they needed, you would learn that, that love is taking care of someone and, and ignoring your own needs. And that is the beginning, the childhood beginning of what is going to be adult codependency or self-love deficit disorder. So the relationship template is your under, is your, is your unconscious predilection for a certain type of person that matches up. So chemistry is the unconscious matching up of relationship templates. Chemistry is not conscious. Lust is. <laughs> References. You can say, I love people that are eight feet tall. Um, or I love, and I, I want to say eight feet tall because I don't want to, because I don't think anyone's eight feet tall because I don't want you to get any angry emails from tall people. <laughs> right. Um, or if there is eight feet tall. Okay. Um, so there's all these other things that work in relationships that are conscious, but what creates this feeling is when it's the dance. It's like if you feel natural with a person. So an SLD, remember I talked about the dance? Mm -hmm. Their relationship template will match up with a, um, a narcissist who's selfish, self-centered, whatever. And that is chemistry. Now, people will tell you, and, and I promise this happens 99% of the time, I know that sounds a little bit confident, but I do believe it, is if you're an SLD or a codependent, or if you know one, ask them if they've ever been on a date with someone who's really nice and sweet and kind and a good listener. And then they will say, well, well yes, and, and, and you'll say, how'd it go? And they said, there wasn't chemistry. Mm -hmm. I, just, you know, I, I know this because <laughs> I'm not here to talk about my relationships, but, but it, it, um, there wasn't chemistry. And, 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 the, and they're sometimes disappointed. Oh, the per he's, you know, he's got a job. He's so nice. He listens to me. He opens the door. He paid for the bill. He uh, doesn't have five wives and eight children. And, you know, um, but it feels like a brother. Or, and, and that means as much as you want the good one, your relationship template, the unconscious forces are stronger. So chemistry is that pull that replicates what we learned in our childhood. And the way we change our chemistry is by healing the, the, the trauma, the wounds, and et cetera, which is beyond the scope of this, this interview, maybe another one. Mm -hmm. um, and as we get healthier, our relationship cha um, template changes and, and our human magnet syndrome um, patterns change we still can be attracted to someone who's opposite, but we tend to go towards people that actually love themselves and take care of themselves. So, so chemistry is the heart and soul of what, what constitutes the human magnet syndrome. Mm -hmm. Well, and I raised my hand. So for the podcast listeners, you, you didn't see that. But um, when you identified the date with the really nice guy and, uh, and because, you know, I, I came through my own recognition here for one in my darkest period of time in my life where I um, which was about seven, you know, over seven years ago. And I freely admit this and, and my friends knew it and they joked with me about it was that I actually was attracted to younger guys. Right. right. And didn't know why. And I would brush it off with just this arrogant statement of, well, because I can. Right. I mean, men have yeah, been younger women for years. Why can't women, you know, date I, I, men? There's <laughs> nothing pathological about that. I don't know right. about it. As long as 
you're okay yeah. with it, and, and they're and they've graduated, and you're not breaking yeah. them. Graduated right. high school, you're right. not breaking the law. <laughs> right. That was not to be a joke, people. Yeah, <laughs> but but I'll, I'll tell you though. But then after going through a healing process, you know, and understanding, it was like, okay, well then why? Because those relationships were unsustainable. Because where right. I found myself in, and it's not that any age difference relationship is an unsustainable. I'm telling you what my my realization was on this whole chemistry. I was the oldest with younger brothers. My company right. that I started, I hired younger men. They were my younger brothers. I was very comfortable and very familiar in navigating the emotional roles of younger men. I easily slipped into the role of big sister and in my personal relationships. Now, the ones that I had the most chemistry with were the ones also then that began to exhibit that narcissistic behavior that was reflective of my relationship with my mother. So now you started to have all these pieces. When we talk about this chemistry, it's like, I know this is important. Now, right. I also have always, um, and you know, and this is a part of that still to me is um, the nickname, again, the nickname that we, we had for um, the young men that I dated um, were the danger boys, because I also had an interest in, you know, guys that love to do dangerous sports and activities. And not because I ever did any of those things, but because it was what I couldn't do in myself. I could not do those things no matter how badly I wanted. So it was this being able to vicariously live through those experiences, supporting those experiences, witnessing those experiences actually fueled me in that way. And so today when I look at this, it's like, you know, I, I feel really good about no longer having this, you know, desire to go out with men that are 10, 15 years younger than me. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and my friends joke that now they're age appropriate. <laughs> um, but I still really appreciate the, um, the kind of the edgier counterculture, but in a way that it exhibits to me, this is a person who is willing to push an envelope. This is a person who's willing to, um, live a little more freely because I have had a, a life of, of moving through different situations and not being fearful of new conditions and new, and, you know, new things. But I definitely do know my chemistry is more attracted to somebody that has done some self work, some growth can have good conversations, you know, sit me down with somebody that's all those things and can actually be nice and ask me questions. And now you're, you're ringing my bell, but before the nice guy, just was like, eh. And what I said to myself emotionally, again, sharing this for everybody else in my brain was, is I'm going to eat this guy alive. This guy's too nice. I need resistance. I need somebody who's going to fight me back. And guess what? Those relationships don't work. I mean, they didn't for me, you know? And, and, and that's an example where the self-talk are lies. Um, we tell ourselves what we want to hear to not to avoid the shame. You know, you know, when I would fall in love with someone um, who's a narcissist, you know, it was, she's beautiful, she's charming, she's likable, she's this. It was all that self-talk was how great she is. Um, and one is, I mean, that's what I saw because that's what I needed. Um, but your, your story represents a couple things. That they represent the, malleabil the malleability of the human spirit and how people can grow and how it shows how because of your own um, willpower and your own desire to become healthier, you moved yourself forward and healed and changed your attraction patterns, your relationship template. Um, so that's one thing I like about what I heard. What I also heard is that um, um, you can, um, you can, like a lot of the people I work with, you can make a decision that you don't want to be attracted to someone who starts off feeling right to you, um, that ends up being hurt, hurtful. You don't have to be that person anymore. And you can go into therapy and you can do the work and you um, can change. But I want to tell you, your listeners and viewers that the change only happens when you can get to the core. And that is within therapy, you can get to the attachment trauma. Um, you can, um, and, and this is where I want to introduce my, my SLDD pyramid. Self-love deficit disorder, or codependency, it's only a, for symptoms. SLDD is an attraction to the narcissist, taking care of someone, giving all the love, respect, and care to others and not to yourself. It's symptoms. The core, the cause was the trauma as a child, the core shame of feeling fundamentally broken or not good enough that comes from the attachment trauma, the pathological loneliness, the bone aching feeling, this existential disease that you're not any good or safe unless you're in a relationship. That's an, and then the next level is the addiction, the SLDD addiction, is that if you are not in a relationship, you will, be, you will have the most painful um, experience of loneliness. 
And then at the very top of, of, this, of this pyramid is the problem. So it seems to me that you must have worked on those core issues in your own um, journey to, to change your relationship template so that you could start being attracted to the good folks, not the good folks, the healthy folks. And your, your, your shift in not being attracted to younger men meant something must have shifted in, your, in yourself where you didn't need that feeling. Uh, may, my guess is, and, and I don't want to analyze you on your show, and please okay. don't, and don't answer, but my guess is your attraction to younger men was a feeling of mastery, a feeling of importance, a feeling of self-esteem, mm -hmm. um, maybe power that maybe you didn't have. So you've obviously done good work and, and are a good representative or a role model to your viewers of how this can change. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And it does take a lot of work. I mean, it definitely did. And one of the things that I've shared on the show before was I actually recognizing in healthy patterns in myself, I took myself out of the game for a year. I sat with that bone aching loneliness for a long time and then realized it wasn't going to kill me. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to get through the, you know, because I've seen a lot of people do this in relationships and, you know, and some of my listeners will probably admit that they've done this themselves is that they break up with one person and they can't even stand a week without having somebody else before they jump back in with another person. And, you know, I've had those people approach me and when I see that jump, 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 and I'm like, just, that's where my, my hands go up and, you know, because if they aren't doing a lot of growth and self-work, they don't know that they're doing that. They don't know that they're just trying to, you know, hopscotch, you know, into the next comfortable, you know, phase. But I did make a choice. It sucked. It hurt. It was lonely. It was um, sad. But I knew on the other end of this, I was going to be able to, you know, free myself in the way that, you know, a person with any kind of an addiction got it, you know, some cases, and it, maybe not everybody, but for me, it was go cold turkey. And so it was a year, the first year. And I know that doesn't sound like very much, but when you've been the type of person like I am and, and some of my listeners are, when I've been in a relationship constantly since I was 16 years old and you're 30 some years into the future, one year is a lifetime of being able to extricate yourself out of these patterns and, and these behaviors. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and it's so important for the people watching or listening to this podcast is to understand that this codependency or SLDD thing, it's an addiction. And I've been working with addicts my whole 32 year career and I know addiction um, and SLDs who go through the addiction and the withdrawals, the withdrawals and pathological loneliness is the, the, the most prominent painful withdrawal symptom. Um, people who have tried to quit alcohol, um, heroin, they will say that the addiction and the withdrawals from SLDD codependency is far more painful and takes much longer than these other addictions because it's just not the chemical detox. It is the whole life of feeling important when you are an appendage, appendage of someone else. So if you understand the addiction and you listen to what Amija said, that sometimes it takes six months or a year because what you're doing is you're rewiring every bit of your personality um, and moving towards a life and where you can love yourself based upon who you are, not what, how someone could help you escape what you don't like or don't love. Yeah. I, you know, and I remember a feeling, I, I call this one of many, you know, periods of rock bottom, but I do have this one moment and I, you know, I don't know that I'll forget this for a while of sitting in my car, crying, calling up my ex this abusive ex that I knew I needed nothing else to do with and needed to get far away. But that draw back that getting some sort of relief from that person was better than the loneliness. Right. You know, and that is, you know, and I've, and I've seen and heard other people talk about that too. They keep going back to the person they know they shouldn't be going back to because there is no other resource. They have no other resources in them internally at that point. I had no resources. I was angry that I didn't have a family I could go to for comfort is why I was, you know, I'm in the situation that I'm in. Um, but that the only way I knew how to fill, you know, this hole inside of me was to try to tap back into an empty well, you know, and, and not, you know, and so at that moment, it was like, I really do need to work harder. And I was already in therapy at that point. And that's the other thing is like, even being in therapy doesn't mean that you suddenly are magically cured of right. all of these terrible, hard feelings that you have to go through, but going through them is a part of the process, you know, of really it, to get to a place, like I said, where I feel, you know, I'm not cured or perfect now. I do sense, you know, that draw, but now I, 
I see that person totally different. My body responds to them very differently. And I talked about this on another episode. A narcissist appeared in my life earlier this year. And I had the exact original chemistry attraction for all the things, you know, it was like this whole checkbox of like, you know, seems to be, you know, well connected, seems to be very, you know, important, seems to be blah, 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 totally, you know, is flattering the crap out of me right now. That's a checkbox, likes me, you know, whatever. But then there was a couple of conversations where then I felt myself triggered, like my body respond in a very visceral and negative reaction. And that's when I recognized, oh my God, this is what I have right here in front of me. This, this person has triggered inside of me the protection mode, the um, anger mode, you know, all the, the old feelings, the trauma feelings that before I would have disregarded them or just kind of floated right over the top and kept zeroing in on the one or two green flags that I thought I saw and dismiss all the red flags. Yeah, I'm, 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 it's actually, I'm, I'm grateful you brought that up because it kind of segues into um, my latest work and um, me writing my new book and a training that um, I'm going to be releasing. I, I sell full length seminar videos, but it's called the healing, the inner trauma child um, uh, healing and trauma integration method. And in that um, seminar, I talk about, how to solve SLDD, this codependency, is you have to resolve the trauma. And I explain that the trauma of our attachment, our attachment trauma is unconscious. We just can't go into therapy and say, I want to solve it because it's actually taken offline from our conscious mind and moved somewhere else. And, but I explain that we have body memories. So trauma we might not remember what happened to us and how much we suffered as a child. And I call those affective memories. Those are disassociated and hidden. But the body memories, we can feel sensations in our body when we feel danger, threat, or when we feel, for that matter, you know, love, you know, when we fall in love with a narcissist, our body reacts. And so what you are mentioning is extremely important that until you actually get to the trauma and, and connect to what was disassociated, you have to listen to your body because your body will communicate when you are in a dangerous uh, place. You might not remember what happened to you as a child and why your body is reacting, but if you have a, a stomach pain, a, a neck tension, a backache, it could be any, a headache, your body is saying, get the heck out of there you just might not be healthy enough to remember or connect why that is right right and i and i in the last two years of this intense therapy and i've shared this with other people too that right there has been a huge turning point in then seeing the world totally different for myself because um like you said you know the brain is picking up on those danger signals it's the first things that we learn about and so when you notice and, and i've done training sessions in business with people to for um for men and women to know when they're going to when they're being triggered like in a in a board meeting or mm -hmm. meeting with coworkers and somebody says something to them to notice that if they if they feel it first in the body that it it may not be what's really going on it may be a trigger from you know something that an experience that they had you know and communication skills that they learned you know whatever their family of origin was um, but is. when i started to and i have actually i have rheumatoid arthritis and so one of my guests is a, we speak about um, chronic illnesses and diseases and what i also noticed was that um, this narcissistic person flared up my RA. And that was the other part of it is that once I started to feel that surge of the, the kind of the fight hormones in there, my joints started to swell up and ache and I had to change my medication. Like it was that severe. And that's when I was like, okay, now my early warning detection system is pretty strong. Right. Um, and I, and, and honoring that makes a huge difference, you know, for sure. Um, so I know, I know we got to wrap this up um, really quickly, but and soon, but um, um, this these ideas that I've developed about trauma um, and explaining, well, you know, some of the pyramid, SLDD is really a trauma disorder, a shame, core shame disorder, loneliness, addiction, what we talked about earlier. And, and the resolution of it is to solve the trauma, which in itself is inaccessible because it's disassociated. And that the fact that until we connect to what was disassociated, we have to listen to our body. And, and these are, I mean, th this is material for a whole hour discussion. Right. But, but I created, I, I just 
this material for the book that I'm going to write and will be done in, in about a year. But um, these, um, this video is going to be released in a couple of weeks, and it's called The Healing the Inner Trauma Child, or, or the Hitch Psychotherapy Trauma Integration Method. And for any of your, your viewers and listeners, and of course, I mean, I'll send you a free copy. Um, and um, um, I couldn't recommend it more, um, um, but it's a whole topic in itself. Awesome. Well, and you're right on the time here. And I, I did want to get to this last point here before we wrap up and we let everybody know how to contact you. And again, I'll say this at the end, but everybody knows all the links that Ross is giving us are all going to be in the show notes. So everybody can click right towards everything that he's got here. But um, I want to go back to the fact that, again, we, we typically think of the narcissistic codependent relationship as being a female codependent and a male narcissist because culturally in society, women are groomed to be caregivers where men are not, but that's not the case. And I think that even you've had some experience as you've indicated in here as well. And like I said, I know men are. So what's going on when it seems to be culturally a reverse situation? Um, uh, you know, what are you seeing in the men that find themselves in the self-love deficit and finding themselves with a narcissistic woman? Well, first of all, um, I, I don't believe that um, um, there's such a disparity between um, men and women in SLDD or codependency. Um, I believe that um, um, our society and our culture um, determines how freely and openly we talk about it, think about it, and seek services. And women because of so many reasons, are communicators and, and, and more um, able to talk about feelings and less, um, they have less vulnerability, less vulnerability in seeking help and men are the opposite. But that does not explain that women are codependent and men are not. Codependency is created, as I described in my book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, and talked about earlier in this podcast, is created by your attachment trauma. Plain and simple. So if you are a boy and you are and your dad is a narcissist and you are dad's little prince and you realize that you can get beloved by somehow shaping yourself into this idealized version for your dad to make him feel good about himself, that is the boilerplate. That is the foundation for future adult codependency. Now, that man who is going to be a codependent is going to fall in love with narcissistic women. He's not going to talk about it as much. He's not going to go to therapy. He might not even think about it, but it does not. Um, um, so in my estimation, I'm 58 years old. I've been in therapy for a while. I've been doing this a long time, is that um, codependency is not gender specific or patterned by gender. I would guess that of all the SLDs in the world, uh, maybe uh, 40% are men and 60% are women. Um, but a good example of how statistics can fool you, on Instagram, 85% of all my followers are women and 15% are men. On YouTube, um, 70%, 68% are women and 32 are men. Um, it, it doesn't mean anything other than people that are looking for answers. It doesn't say if they have a problem or not. So there are so many SLD men that don't have a clue because of our culture, because of everything that you just said. Mm -hmm. but, but, it's, but culture and, and society does not create or, or um, buffer or mitigate SLDD. Mm -hmm. It just, um, it makes it easier for someone to know about it, talk about it and seek help. Right, right. And that's actually, and I think that's probably one of the, the saddest things. And you had posted something about this, which I had shared on my Facebook page, you know, kind of preemptively for our interview today, is about the fact that men are less likely to reach out. And I, I'm very happy that some have reached out to me. They've, they've found the show, they've listened to the topics. And again, while, while the topics have been generally an interview with like, you know, Wendy Bahari, who I know you know, oh, um, about awesome. narcissism. I yeah. love Wendy. Yeah. And so there, you know, there can be a tendency. And when I share my story, I'm a woman, you know, dealing with it, but to have men reach out and say, like, I've been in this relationship myself and I've been surprised, but I'm also been pleased that they've had the, um, the inertia to actually say something about it and identify with the fact that it, it, it can actually happen. And they are using resources, you know, to be able to get themselves some help, which is what I'm hoping that this interview will also be a step towards them finding 
um, you know, additional services and resources through you. So let's get to that. You have this amazing YouTube channel that's got like over 140 some thousand followers and 10 million views, which are content for people to learn more about what you have, um, as well as the book, which is an obvious um, go. What, what are other ways that people can resource from Ross Rosenberg and get some help with this? May I correct you? Not 10 Please. million views, 14 million. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, after I got a million, I, 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 I couldn't believe it was happening. Right, you know, right, um, yeah. Um, the YouTube um, is, uh, I put up bits and pieces um, here and there. Um, and um, 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 I have the book, and it's really important to tell your viewers that um, the publisher of my first book is um, really pushing this. Don't buy this book, this, or if you have this book, this is the first book. It has about 130 pages. And by the way, this, I love this book, and this has helped. 50,000 people or more. Um, the new book was rewritten. Everything about it is a lot more detailed or and organized. Um, and that's available at anywhere you can buy books, including at my Self Love Recovery Institute um, company, which is at selflovecovery.com. Self that's where I sell my full length seminar videos that go into depth, everything I talk about. Um, and um, I have a retreat, um, a, a three-day life-changing transformational retreat, and, and other services and, and products that I offer that are about helping codependents or SLDs overcome this problem. Um, and But I, I could not be more grateful um, for you to invite me um, to, onto your podcast because I think, I think you're brilliant and a perfect person to um, uh, get this information out because you, you, you have these, your own experiences that you've molded into not only making yourself better, but to helping others. So keep up this great work on me. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. And I, I mean, my gratitude is to you because um, I learn every time I have an opportunity to meet amazing people like yourself. And then I know that there are, you know, people out there that benefit from these conversations and stuff. And so um, for you to take the time, I know you said that you do this rarely. And so I, I'm very grateful that you've chosen to do this with me as well. So thank you. You're welcome.